What's up, people? You're locked into the two, 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 two Pro One Slow Podcast. All right, episode 22, we're back in, um, spoiling them. We're pretty much back to back with these, um, and this episode has actually got a sponsor. Redline Motorcycles are sponsoring this one. They've got a nice uh, mini bike behind us that they're going to give away. Um, you've just got to follow them on Instagram, but we'll discuss that at the end, so you have to stay tuned to win that. But yeah, once again, thanks to Redline Motorcycles for sponsoring the episode. We have got Tommy, as usual. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm good. Warm enough? Not uh, tired? Quite cold, actually, because you've had doors open, but yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. And uh, we've got Jeff Perrett. How are you, mate? I'm all right. I've got to say, before we go into it, you do look a bit tired. <laughs> I am. He is, isn't he? I think you you two are over. I've yeah. actually, I got up this morning, I had a, such a bad morning, that I went back to bed. I said, I'm going to start the day again. I had a, at 11 o'clock, I went back, had a 30 minute nap, and now I've got up and now I've come here. Well, to restart, kick yeah, start I just I've had a real bad morning. I've booked the wrong, doing an international in France. I've booked the wrong. First, I booked it late, so I couldn't get my Euro Tunnel back. I booked a Euro Tunnel out. Then I tried getting a boat back. Went through to book it, booked a car on. So then rebook, done another booking, and I've booked to come back Sunday night when I meant to come back Monday night. But I've done it by a shit website not like direct i've gone direct ferries it's called and now i've got no confirmation so i'm on the phone to the bank now trying to get them to cancel it so i can i've just had a man mate. Mate. i hope you unclick the box can you spin that i can spin into your in <laughs> there you go there we go we <laughs> can't spin very well um I, did you click the box because i'll tell you what you don't want them sending you a load of stuff because i did that and they're relentless with the emails uh, what direct ferries yeah don't do that well i've called the <laughs> bank right, and just said, a tip that is i've called the bank and said stop that payment and then i've they didn't want to stop it, and then I've convinced them now to dispute it, and I'm going to book somewhere else. So just a bit of a a bad morning, really. But it's I'm back tough, and now. I really feel good about it. I've I woke <laughs> up a new man after my a little twenty minute nap, and I even said to the missus, "That's done me the world of good." They do say that it's well, tough at the top, Ed. You need one of them. That, that's that's an intro I didn't think we were going to end up with uh, hearing all about your dilemmas of booking. No, but I'm back on full it now. Doesn't surprise me one bit, to be honest with you. Not one bit. He's an adult now. I was no. thinking driving up here, you two, uh, when I first bumped into you two all those years ago. <laughs> a couple of bumbling clowns. I think, well, one time uh. in America, whatever, young pups out there, all the world in front of them. I thought, yeah, they're going to have a good time. <laughs> and now look at you, both hanging, haggard. Yeah, we're well, knackered. Knackered, yeah. We are. We're, worked, we're overworked, underpaid. Mm. I'm sure it you is, are. Um, it is mad how long we've known you. And then we were just saying beforehand... I was thinking on the way, when was the last time you come out? And I was thinking it was with Lewis a few years ago, but actually it was in 2007. You was KTM, factory, yeah. factory KTM then. Um, yeah, a long time ago. Lots changed since then, of course. And, um, not, and not a lot at the same time. Yeah, I know. It's mad, isn't it? Cause yeah, <laughs> you haven't changed much. I don't think you've changed too much, you know, in my opinion. Still just like, riding Well, bikes. you see, he's got, see, he's, he's always played this thing anywhere he's kind of like, but it makes out like he doesn't really know what's going on. But he, he does. <laughs> and he always has done. First time I met you was at Matcham's one year. Uh, he was on a, uh, I think a KT, no, Kawasaki 125. Was you, no, yeah. you might have been, you might have been on, a, on an eight. No. It would have been a Kawasaki 125 or a Kawasaki 8. That was it. You just got on a 125. Mm. And I actually thought to myself then, when I first came over and started speaking to you, I thought, oh, he's a, you know, like, I, I just thought, <laughs> he's a, he's a, not sure, I can't. I couldn't really make out your accent for one. <laughs> I thought, where does you know, where's he from, or whatever? And I just thought he's a bit of a, he's a bit of a sort of wide boy, bit of a bit of a geezer back then. <laughs> yeah, I knew you'd be trouble. Ed thought the same when I turned up here. His family thought, "Fuck me, who's this bloke?" Yeah. We did, generally did. He got out of the van, and then about five steps behind him, his little brother Troy at the time, who would probably be about five, he jumped out of the van barefoot. We got a little bit of a, a stream thing that runs through. He's in the stream, just freezing cold winter. Yeah. No shoes. I didn't know Ed, obviously. And Jamie, um, Ed's dad, actually, um, his company sponsored Jamie Dobb. So that's how we, we all started coming up here, yeah. really, through Jamie. And then Jamie brought me up because was, he was then managing me. So I come up. And, yeah, I remember them saying after, fucking hell, when you turn up, we thought, who's this in a tracksuit? His brother's there running through the stream. And then he was <laughs> up in the loft or something. Weren't we trying to get something out? Oh, I don't know. It was fucking wild. It was definitely wild. But, yeah, it's always been a bit... Um, We've been a bit just going with the flow, really. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't. I got. I got. I genuinely got to say, I didn't think you you'd get to where you are, where you are now. I mean, I knew when I first watched you, like, um, I clearly you could tell you was like you was good. And as a young kid, then not you know you. 
it's just like you were only focused on riding and you didn't have any idea what that what goes on in the world outside of that still, still still don't, don't no still doesn't well he does now because he's booking his own ferries and everything no i've always yeah, been look quite how that's good gone. At, i've always been quite good at doing flights and things like that this is just a a rare mishap i haven't the book flights or anything for a long time since the race in england so i think <laughs> i'm off the i'm out the loop of it all <laughs> bless you no it's good it's good i mean you know for me um that's funny you said yeah oh, you didn't think i'd get i just thought just because i thought well maybe because you've had good advice you know and and you've you've got good you've had good guidance but then you were just tearing around doing laps you didn't seem to have any structure you know as, as i said you know but you were young so well also my you know i think that's how it is when you're young isn't it and also my family didn't we was not from motocross yeah so when so you get someone no like idea. yourself who's gone through it all you'll probably look at someone hey, he's just wild he's fast but there's nothing yeah he don't know what he's doing sort of thing but then i was quite lucky that someone then said at the time it was jamie and then i so you might be right with that that mm. you then you got picked up you had something and then you got picked up and then it got all pushed in the right yeah, way the right guidance yeah that's just clearly the raw speed was there there you go see with the right people around you, you can you can still be an idiot, <laughs> you know, and, you know and, still, and still make it. No. You've Quite. done all right there, Tommy, I've got to say. You've done all right. You've done us proud. Fair play. No, thank you. Well, by now, you're probably seven minutes in. If, you were, if, you've not, if you're not watching this and you're listening to it, you'll definitely recognise Jeff's name. Uh, voice, sorry, not name. But I've been doing a bit of research myself, Jeff. Oh, God. So still now, by the looks of it, you're yeah. reading it off, <laughs> off the website somewhere. Yeah, he's a busy bloke. Like I said, he, you know, he's, I've yeah. also had a minor blip here because I wrote this in the notes section and it's gone. But now I've reverted back to where it's from. So, Jeff. Oh God, I'm nervous now. So you start. I'm normally on the other side of this, aren't yeah. I? So, y- yeah, this is this is it now. Oh, and I suddenly feel all, all guest feel when I get them started in the racing in 1981. Yeah, did. Um, you had a passion for it, apparently. Oh, I must add. I think you've written this yourself. I could could well be. <laughs> <laughs> My own pitch. Uh, is that what I sent to you the other day? <laughs> this is actually on the Dirt Hub uh, oh, profile page. okay. I, I didn't actually write that. How did you not? No. Well, you moved into British Motocross where you worked as a regular, uh, sorry, raced as a regular and became a top 10 British contender. Yeah. More than that, wouldn't you? Uh, the best result I had was in 98. I finished fifth in what is now MX1. Yeah, but that's I was sort of top. 10 in the championship pro. yeah oh man riding for yeah because i eastward this is quite good for me to hear because obviously i know you've been around forever but i don't actually know your story on it as such you know did you I feel good that he said i've been around forever did you know that well, he raced you, the 250 gps as a privateer from 95 to 2000 i would have known you was racing <laughs> gps as a privateer yeah i knew yeah. i know a fair bit because obviously through the years but i don't know the whole what how did you get into it, it doesn't say the, that i started out with hair at that point <laughs> i had hair up until 98 how did i start oh wow that was um back then you had to be on a grade in this you couldn't we were just talking about it before we came on air you couldn't you couldn't just sort of buy your way effectively into gps you had to be basically in the top 10 in whichever championship you was racing in the uk be it one to okay. five 250 or 500 before you could even then they'd even give you a license and you could go and try and oh, qualify wow so it kind of there was a process there was an actual sort of route to the top you couldn't it wasn't just all about you know like having a, a big sponsor or if you had rich parents or anything you had to earn it you had to be good enough in the uk before they'd even yeah. give you a, a chance to do it so how'd you do that racing like the the, the national british yeah the british stuff. championship yeah so right. basically you had to finish i think it was the top top 10 they, they basically took eight i think it was eight or ten riders from each class one two five two fifty and five hundred yeah and that they were the kind of uk representatives to go and do gps so if you obviously they had a few where you'd have like i wouldn't say wild cards but if a top rider got injured and missed a year then obviously they'd go you know whatever but for those trying to get to the top you had to you couldn't just sort of rock up get a license and go and do gps you had to be when you say gps did it by or you're that you're in that top eight that's not you're racing you've then got to go and qualify a gp yeah that's just to get get to the, the GP, gp right so yeah, they obviously you now you don't have to qualify when you're there you're there you could yeah. be 15 seconds lap slower you're there you're racing both races well i think that's it. I, i'm not completely clued up where, no, where it's at the minute it is, but yeah. you know I, i'm guessing if i went and won the euro millions i could go oh i'm gonna go and do an mx gp in yeah, argentina there's actually a funny story the other day <laughs> just to go off subject it was about glenn coldenhoff's step uh not step brother his missus his brother was on holiday and they'd done a GP somewhere and the FIM wanted some riders. So they says, 
he was out there in that country like a, a overseas race. I can't remember. Anyway, they paid for him to just come. No, you are making that, that up. Didn't you he score are a making point? That yeah, up. and he scored a point. No, that's the God's honest truth. They says, yeah, if you want to come and race, we need riders. He ain't, he ain't, don't even ride. Head. Ride for a bit of fun. He come. We could get a point. The, he gun, done <laughs> the race. probably got a point. They said, and they paid for all his expenses to come, give him a bike. He raced a race. Like, I need to check on that, but I was told just the well, other week and that. Wouldn't you the there when they were telling us? I'm pretty sure I've heard that story, yeah cogs in my head are turning now yeah. like the idea to go and do that no you could do that easy it's like being an extra in a film set isn't it yeah just like be, be on standby look we're short of riders yeah you can we'll do give that you a shot. if you went to Argentina of course you can line up Mate, I better I better look at ne- when the calendar comes out for next year I think I better no you trip. can that's not that's not even like a joke you can in an overseas race you could go line up and you could race what was your um, what was your best result at the GP oh. Uh, my best result. This is this is this is a killer. But well, no, I've lived with it. I've learned to live with it. Right? <laughs> all bad um, questions. No, no, it's not. It's all right. It's all right because because I was never on a you know I never quite got good enough to be picked up by what you know like a British a top British team or whatever. So I was always privateer. So my best result was actually a handful, about four. I think about about four sixteenths in in the two fifty class. Mm-hmm. Which at the time, yeah, you know, became like it was on the cusp, like uh, mid mid nineties. The power shift kind of started to move from the five hundred class being the premier class to the yeah. two fifty. Yeah. You know, we had like Everts, Tortelli, Beera, Bavorts. You know, the list goes on. So to just you know be yeah. there and qualify for me as a as a privateer that was fitting window. I was, I was a window yeah. fitter in the week, fitting windows, trying to earn money, then go off and do GPs. Nice. So I had a handful of four sixteenths uh, because points only went down to fifteenth then. Ah. So I never ever scored a point. Oh, I see why it was a. Yeah, oh, then we've got to go to Argentina. We've yeah. got to go to Argentina. <laughs> it's not okay. over. It's I not could, over. No, it's not. That's what I mean. The dream's not over. This is this has rekindled my fire for it. But like you were saying before, we come on air. We had a little chat. There was sometimes you had 110 people going to try yeah. and qualify for the race. Oh, so, so getting 16, yeah, you're getting a top qualifier. You're yeah. still chuffed to nuts. No, that's the in time, the racing, surely. obviously. Like, yeah. So initially, you'd go there. Some GPs, there'd be more entries than others, like France, you know, or, or popular yeah. countries like that. And you'd have two groups. And yeah, I think, you know, you'd get some, some cases, like I said, up to over 100 riders and they'd split them into groups. So you'd have more than 50 riders in a qualifying group in a 40 minutes qualifying session. It was like madness out there. People wow. going bandsai. And if you got in the top 20 in your group, you're straight into the race. If you're 21st, you'd be reserved, first or second reserve. No last, chance, no, no last chance, just 2020. No last chance, that's it, just, just straight in. Yeah. So my first ever GP was Televera in 95, and I qualified as, as first reserve. So my first ever GP, I was, I was 21st. I got to ride the second race because Rob Herring completely splattered himself, did like a John Rambo impression off the... You've ridden Talavera. Yeah. You know, when you get to the highest point of the track and it sweeps around the corner, it kind of drops away. Yeah. Where Herring just launched, like, clear off that into, into a load of trees. He was just, like, pinned up in trees. Shit. Done his leg in and I got to ride. But the interesting story about that was, because we were full privateer, my brother uh, came, obviously, he was my mechanic. And um, anyway, I got to qualify... Kind of. Or oh, we got start money. We knew we, that was the main thing. That was getting some money to pay for the trip. My first ever attempt was like... Oh, so because you was 21st, a reserve even got qualifying yeah, money. Yeah, basically. You were, so we were just... You know, I went there with no real expectation. First ever GP, didn't really know what I was doing type thing and managed to get, get some money back. Uh, and then they used to have a massive party in town. Like, because the town's not far away, right. is it? massive shindig like a huge marquee and all the town came out of course me uh my best mate who came with me chip and my brother went down to town to party i thought i better not you know as tempting as it was and it was thought oh i might get a ride tomorrow so i better not first ever gp better be you know i know i'm a privateer but i better try and take it a little bit serious went to bed woke up in the morning no sight of sound of those two at all (laughs) nothing (laughs) Clock's ticking. We're getting going out for the first, like, you know, just free practice session on the oh, Sunday. Oh, because you don't still do warm-up. Yeah. yeah, they still do a warm-up, which you get to go yeah. out with if you're a reserve. It's getting, like, half an hour to go. This is before mobile phones. It's cause none of, you know, they didn't have a mobile phone or anything, so I couldn't call them. So in the end, I'm getting the bike out myself. I'm checking it over. I'm, it's, like, 10 minutes to go. Well, I better get kitted up, I suppose. <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. And I literally just went out and... Didn't just went out and then sort of cruised around and, and like a like almost like a lost dog. Yeah, I kept coming in after a couple of laps into the pit box and sort of going, 
<laughs> can't see them. Might as well go back out again. Went out, you know. So I did that whole session, and then, and then when I came back, I could see I could see that the van door had been opened. So I put the bike on the stand, and I basically opened the back door of the van. And there's a scene in Jaws. I don't, I don't know if you've seen it. Obviously, it's an old film, but where this guy's head falls out the bottom of the boat, and it was like that. I literally opened the back doors of the van to put my take my crashing off and my brother was so drunk that he got into the van <laughs> the workshop closed the door behind him and fallen asleep against the door so as i opened the door he just sort of <laughs> presented himself like that i was like jesus my first ever gp and look at the state of you two like they were absolutely wrecked <laughs> and this is what 10 in the morning my first, yeah it's my first ever gp so then st- literally by the time I, I did get to ride the second race my brother was just kind of starting to come around a little bit, but he was making like, you could tell he was hammered and we was in the waiting zone. And he, he was just sort of stood there like almost falling asleep because he was that hanging. <laughs> and all of a sudden he just jumped up like really loud when it was quite, quite, quite a moment, just jumped up really loud and went, fuck. <laughs> I was like, now what? And it, so he like, almost fallen asleep, but he'd fallen asleep against somebody's bike and burnt his leg <laughs> on the exhaust pipe, and all. And I'm just like that. That set the tone for my entire GP career. That, that's <laughs> that was it. Yeah, well, that's I, good stories. You don't get stories like that nah, now. But we used to have them like that. With your dad, and I, his mate I was, Gary. I actually so my dad and his best mate Gary used to come with me and. He used to do the same. He used to wake up and not know how he was going to get to the track because they'd be pissed. There's so many races I know, like um, any of the ones with a decent town, Bulgaria. (laughs) uh, I'm sure. Czech Republic. I remember waking up in Czech. Bulgaria, the first one, first round of the year. I was with Moss and I've I've, I've gone out and think whatever. But then my dad's gone to go out in town. He's like, I'll be go out for a little drink. Anyway, he's gone out. He's then got lost and he's pissed up. So he got pulled over by the police. They said, where are you going? And he says, well, I'm going back to the hotel. He didn't really know where. And then in the end, he just went back to the track because that's all he could find his way back to. He slept in the car. And then I've woke up in the morning, no, was sharing a hotel room. So no dad. And I've just gone, all oh, right, I don't know how I'm getting to the track. And so I go down at breakfast. And then there's other people in the hotel that obviously race bikes. Um, so then I jump in, get a lift with someone. And then I get there, he's still asleep in the car. And... But he's just, <laughs> it's just normal. And then I remember another one. I went outside to open the room door in the morning and he's asleep in the hallway. Because <laughs> I said, he was like, why didn't you come in? He says, oh, I didn't want to wake you up. So he, sl- he slept in the hallway outside the bedroom door. There's, there's, you know, one day I think I've thought about it and probably one day I will like maybe put it, put it down. I wouldn't say write a book, but maybe just do kind of like mini stories or whatever. Because, mm. you know, for me as a privateer, look, I was under no... No illusion, you know. I knew I wasn't good enough to to be, um, you know, like a, I would say a, a top rider. And I knew that I, it was like, you know, for me it was, I was always going to be a privateer or not always because I was trying to be good enough to get that ride. But I was comfortable with it even from that, even from that stage in my career. It's like, look, this is how we're going to do it. The old man died when I was 14 and I took a year out of racing. And then collectively as a family, we just said, you know what, let's just, let's just, have fun with it and see how far we can go with it and, no, and don't put that extra pressure on. That's and that's nice. what, and honestly, that's what we did. You know, my brother worked extra hours. My middle brother, Percy, used to do extra, you know, bricklaying and whatever. And we'd all go. Even the old dear, when I said I was going to give it up, you know, she said, no, 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 you're not. There's no way you're fucking giving it up because she does <laughs> like a, to throw an F-bomb in back then. <laughs> and I'm like, well, she goes, no, look, this is, this is all of our sport. Yeah, it's oh, not, it's not about so you. Nice. It gives you like goosebumps. It's now, family, isn't it? it? Yeah. Totally. So that's what we did. And, you know, and, and like I said, that first GP kind of set the tone, really. And then, of course, I, I got to, well, on the very first GP is where I actually officially met and got to know the Eastwood clan. Mm-hmm. That's literally how it happened. So he's on the, on the ferry. Because it was all just sort of like wide eyed. Like it was all like this new thing. We were going off and doing how a GP. We, uh, what age was you? I then? would have been then, I think I was about 20. 21, I would have thought. Cool, yeah, like that, that would be considered a late starter. In I this was a late age. starter. Yeah, yeah. So I'm on the I'm on the ferry, you know, on the ferry uh, crossing over because we take the, the the big one down to Bilbao, and then yeah, and then we, you know, just oh, that's Mark Eastwood over there. It was kind of like that. Well, that's Easter, you know. Yeah, he's quite good. And I thought, oh well, we go and speak to it, you know, because there was nobody else on there. My my brother was already a couple of pints in because he likes a drink, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, 
and we went to chat with him. And then in no time at all, within, within five minutes of chatting to him and Scott, it was just, hold on. Like, it's not like they race motocross. Like, we, we absolutely have, like, got the same interest and everything. Same music, same opinions and all that. And that was it. That, that we were off and running then. That was the whole thing. Jailed. Oh, totally. Like, yeah. I mean, I still obviously speak to Mark as much as I can and Scott. Um, but it, we had such a laugh. Mark had to be more serious because it, it was his job. Mm-hmm. But between... Who was Mark riding for at that point? The first year was Sky Mars Honda. So it would have been DT, I guess. Well, was he the manager at that time? I think he might oh, have been. I wouldn't know. I think he was, yeah, if I remember rightly. People will, will obviously correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm sure Thorpe was running that team at that time. And he was doing pretty pretty good, Mark, you know. So, but obviously Scott was his mechanic a bit more relaxed. But Mark is, well, we all know it Mark. It seems to know? be a lot back then that the family was the mechanic. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But those you two, never, you like, don't get that now. No, you? you don't, not not really. But they are so different in many ways. And that was kind of interesting dynamic, just seeing all that, you know. But we had such a good time. Mark was real focused. He was like a Jekyll and Hyde character. And I know he won't mind me saying this, but, but like in the week... Like, oh man, wow, we're such a laugh. While always, we were always like, you know, up to no good, misbehave. The minute, the very second the vehicle drives through the gate at GP. Serious. Man, oh God, yeah. Like, you don't even want to get near him. Really? really? What, yeah. just go into work mode? Complete work mode, you know? And, he, and, he, and he's just like, oh Christ, what's happened there? Like, <laughs> we were driving down the road half an hour ago. You were laughing, joking over, and now you're like, he, he's like just instantly into race mode. You know, is that a good thing? Yeah, yeah, for him. Yeah, yeah, obviously. But like me, me and Scott and all the rest of us, we were all there just gooning around, you know, and whatever. And we we recorded loads of videos. One day, I said, let alone the book. Um, this is before digital cameras and whatever. But I got a load of footage, you know, from utter just complete <laughs> gooning around. No racing. They don't film any of the racing. They didn't bother any of that. It was all the stuff that happened in between. That's the best Brilliant. stuff. That's the good stuff. The story stuff, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, so for me. I, you know, I had five, six years of doing GPs and, you know, arguably the best, best times I've ever had. I mean, what was there not to like? I was travelling all around the world. My, my whole attitude towards it was, right, let's give it your best shot. If you don't make the cut, I'm on holiday. Yeah. I'm literally out on holiday. Like, I'll, I'll get out in with the crowd. So even if you didn't qualify, you'd still have a good time that weekend? Oh, I never got upset about it. I think in six years, though, I only failed to qualify, I think, four, four or five oh, times. Oh, so, yeah. So, so qualifying, I was pretty good at, and I think I was pretty good at it because I just, I just didn't didn't put the pressure on yourself. What, what was quality back then? Lap, one lap. Yeah, one lap. Just no, know, no racing, no, no, moment, no. Just, boom. just whatever your best time was. Right. And I used to get so many people used to get so g'd up about it, and I was just like, just treat it like I'm riding, like just relax. What? Because what, what, when you're at that stage, what have you got to? Yeah, you're to there. Do? You know, I'm like, I'm, you didn't have anything. To I'm, do, pa- so I'm paying for it. Yeah. I've paid to get myself here, so it's not like I'm going to let anybody down but me. So I, I love that, you know, and it worked out really good for me, yeah. What was, so once you'd done, obviously, your GP career, you, you, like years on now, you're still in the industry. What, what was the transition from finishing GPs to, did you go back to British or did you just start doing something different? Well, I kind of fell into journalism, didn't I? I so I got into that because I was still riding at the time and it, it all kind of changed for me really when I got sponsored by Animal, which at the time was obviously quite a big yeah, clothing I remember brand. that. And I remember you at you Animal. That's yeah. probably about 2005, was it? Yeah, that was towards the tail end of it. So it was around 98 I started working with those guys. But obviously, oh, so so I, was with them, really I was with them for quite a time, yeah. And... Didn't you have a column in Dirt uh, yeah. Rider? Yeah, so that's how it came about. So Whilst you were racing, this was? Yeah. So you used to write about your... Yeah. Right. So Animal, at the time, were obviously a UK clothing brand and, and quite, a, for a better word, you know, cool one. They were with it. They were quite good with all... That's when, sort of, I guess, you know, media was becoming more of a thing and they'd always want to do something quirky and different. Yeah, no, I do remember all that. So, uh, yeah, I got, I got supported by them because they're a local company to me. And then... And that's how it came about. So at the end of 99, when I was, again, switched to Suzuki with, uh, and, and took Animal with me, and Batesy was running the team. And then Sean Lawless, like, so he, he came up to me and said um, he was leaving TMX, I think, at the time, to go and work with a new magazine called MX UK. I don't know if you can remember no, that. It was, I don't remember that. It was from, based down in Bristol, I think. And anyway, he said, look, I want you to write a column. So... I just, I honestly just thought he was taking the piss. So I, I just sort of laughed it off for at least two rounds because he kept coming up to me and saying like, 
And that all stemmed from, at the end of the year, people used to write little thank yous in TMX. And I was reading through them, you know, what writers put, and I thought, that's all a bit tedious, isn't it? <laughs> you know, they all just, like, list people. So I started, I wrote one into Sean, who was the editor at the time, and just, because I knew Animal would like it as well, just wrote a load of old shit, really. So I started writing, like, I'd like to thank, I can distinctly remember writing, I'd like to thank all the women that have let me touch them and all the men who haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to thank the makers of Jack Daniels, Paracetamol, all, all these just random shit, really. And then right at the end, I just listed sponsors like that. <laughs> and, he, and he loved it, and, and he ran it, because I didn't think he would. And then, of course, I guess from that, he thought, okay, you know, he's got something about him that would maybe make a good column. So, and that's how I started in yeah, I do remember your column. I would have been so, really young. Having a column back in the magazine days was like... Yeah, big. Big, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Cool yeah. thing to have. Mm, I remember. It was really cool. So I started at MX UK, and then Sean didn't last very long there because obviously DBR and TMX were part of the same publishing group. So then he got offered the job to be the editor of DBR. Yeah. yeah. And he said, look, would you come back, you know, and come and write a column for DBR, which we then named Rear Gunner, so I always had the back page. Mm -hmm. I said, well, yeah, of course, you gave me the opportunity to start. And and that was it. And then not. And then two or three years down the line, I got asked by Tim March to to come and join Moto and yeah, I remember you know that. and do that. So. Moto was like the well, dirt bike rider. Moto and dirt bike rider were like when Moto was our good era. At the time, that was our cool, sort of. It? I remember that. Like anything that was Moto was pretty cool back in the day for for me, especially and probably your thing as well. Yeah, too. I think I think the Moto days. You know, DBR. At the time, you know, time was the established one, and obviously was really good. But it had been a it had been a formula that had been around for a long time, and I think yeah, guys, it was like new cool at the time. Yeah, and I think you know because it came from um, a media house that did skateboarding, you know, BMX magazines, or whatever. They they looked at the sport completely different, mm -hmm. and Tim was obviously really passionate about it. They had a good designer in Justin, and then for year one they got Wobs involved. You know, so obviously Wobs was. That's the reason Tim asked him to do it. You know, initially he spoke to me about doing it and said that me and Wobbs could work together, but I had to turn it down for a year because I was committed to do the Isle of Wight GP yep. with the team that laid that on. Yeah. So I couldn't, you know, I said, well, I, once we get the GP out of the way, then maybe I can leave DBR. I and did join read up. in this thing that you apparently didn't write that you was uh, it was your idea and you were a big advocate for putting the lap dancing bar at the Irish Isle of Wight no, that, that was my idea <laughs> that was good that was, I remember going to I the am. Isle of Wight GP and the, that was the GP was unbelievable that was my second ever GP yeah and what a GP just from everything went well with it I imagine with from like the weather oh, to unreal. Uh, actually the first year I didn't go because what was the first year you ran it 2004 2004 was the first year we, we, we yeah the first year I was we did it in the first year that I was involved. Then the Chamberlain brothers picked up after the, Rob Bradley, who started that RTT Honda team. Yeah. He then didn't continue with it. So uh, Mark took it over along with Craig Elwell and, and did it for 05. And we had two GPs that year, didn't we? Because we had one at Matcham yeah. as well. That's so. the two I done. Which, what, how, well, what year was that? The first ever GP on the Isle of Wight? Yeah. 04. 04. So I'd have been 14. I remember going to that with my dad and all of his mates and for some weird reason, they thought that if they all crowded round me, they would be able to get me into the lap dancing club. And, and <laughs> really? <laughs> we just got stopped and, at the door. And? Did you? No, I didn't oh. get in. They stopped me. You should have come and see me. I'd have got, got <laughs> you those golden tickets. Was you in there? Well, that was the thing. The next there? day. Security. Was I in there? <laughs> I wouldn't come up with the idea of it. No, I didn't even it, mean and then, it like that. I meant like, was you there or, sorting everyone out there were the passes you were the man to get in that's the thing in it when you start doing any kind of when you're involved in any kind of event people just start hitting you up for passes all mm. the time and yeah. that obviously that particular one i can i can distinctly remember that idea coming to fruition it was we was having like a just a you know a team teams meeting talking about what we could do to be different and i just i literally threw it out there as as a joke so i didn't really come up with the idea we were just talking about a load of things, and I and I just went, "Oh, I tell you what, we should have." We should be joking, basically joking. Went, "Oh, we should have a lap dancing tent. That would be bang on." You imagine that? And I <laughs> left it like that. That's the words I said. I can remember it. And Rob Bradley, who, who was you know doing the whole thing and and basically putting it on, I could see his eyes just instantly gl like glazed <laughs> up, and he 
and it was like that eureka thing and he went and he, he literally did that <laughs> yes <laughs> and i went well can we can we well of course we can we can do anything we want oh, that's brilliant went, all right okay. but it's almost well it didn't make the event but it's just like one of those spectacles isn't it like just obviously i was stories. young i went there and i was racing so i didn't go in but it was like even now do you know like Ed's come out with that. I remember their strip club. Like, yeah. There's two things I they remember. They did one about. at another race. Though. Yeah, yeah. They Matcham. did. Yeah. No, they did one at no, Matterley no. one year. Yeah. And was it, the, they had one at the second year, 2005 think, as well. Yeah, they, they? they continued it on. Well, yeah. wh- look, whatever the next year was, I obviously didn't get in. And then. Matterley Basin. The next yeah, Matterley or whatever. And then I think I'd come with you at that point. Yeah. My dad and all of his mates again obviously went. And it was a stamp on the wrist, wasn't it? And they said, no, they didn't go. And I see them all trying to fucking rub this thing <laughs> off their wrist. Don't tell your mum. <laughs> there's, two, there's two standout stories from the strip, strip tent that I remember. One, we had Chris Rose, Rocket Rose, come out. Because at the time, he was one of the only guys in the UK that was doing fabrication work and built the freestyle ramps. Because we was going to have freestylers there, like Jamie Squibb and all them lot. So we got him to, to bring all his ramps over. And we paid him cash. I, th- I can't remember the figure. Uh, I don't know. It's probably like a grand or something like that. It, I don't think it was more, much more than that. And <laughs> so, yeah, so we paid him cash. We had like a, a private, um, like a private viewing, if you want to call it, on Thursday as a test run through. But they were still sort of taking money. So we paid Chris in cash. And literally by Saturday morning, he was he was asking people to lend him money. <laughs> Give it all away. He absolutely, excuse the, the term, spunked it all in <laughs> in the in the trip tent. And the other one I remember is when there was a group of lads all like drinking down the bottom and just it must lying. have been mate. It was brilliant. Just, it must have been madness in the, in there. I mean, oh, it's amazing. Like I can remember Caroli sneaking in and being in there <laughs> on, on the Sunday night. Um, but anyway, yeah, and there was these. Group oh, well, it even went through Sunday night. Oh, as yeah, well. we went. Yeah, that's the thing. Most people had to get like. Yeah, uh, normally a GP now, but Sunday afternoon they're stripping yeah. everything down. No, no, we we kept it open because that because they wanted it because they were loving it. The girls were making like an absolute killing. Yeah, so they said, you know, yeah, yeah so happily. we kept it kept it running. The other one I remember is they there was a bunch of lads all sat at the bottom of the hill, you know, just lying down, like drinking and, and having a laugh, and the minibus turned up because they were obviously ferried from their hotel. But they were already, they, like, you know, dressed yeah. in, well, scantily <laughs> lot, dressed. Yeah. Not a lot of dress. Uh, it was, I just wish, I wish I had a, a phone, mobile phone or something back then. Because when the, when the slide door opened and these lads saw all these girls coming out, the, the term, well, it's a terrible term, actually, it's derogative. But anyway, literally flies around shit. They, they, <laughs> they just, they jumped up and they were just all round there, like trying to give it, and give it all the large in front of the girls and trying to impress them. I was like, and you could just see the look on the girl's face thinking, wait later, mate, you have to pay. I'm not talking to you now. <laughs> That's mean. It was brilliant. Yeah, it was great. Oh, well, let's move on before we end up talking about the wrong, uh, the wrong yeah. sort of thing. So, nothing wrong with that, Ed. After Isla White, it was. Still moto, or would or did you? Because you started a team as well. When did you start? Your yeah, team? so uh, so I rode for Rob at RTT. That was part of my sort of deal to to lay on the GP because um, I basically so did, you didn't race that GP, did you? No, but it was twofold. Rob was starting a team as well. Yeah, so I bought loads of my personal sponsors to the team, and that was the kind of trade off. He'd pay me a wage to be part of the organising team for the Isle of Wight, along with Julie Coyne, who started the club over there which we're, I'll bring Julie back into the conversation in a minute. So, yeah, so I basically rode for RTT as a fourth rider. So it was Nunny, Dugan, Luke Kennett, who Rob used to support on the Isle of Wight anyway, and then me, like a four-rider team. And it was a big thing. He wanted to go to town with it. We, got, we went off to California to do the photo shoot with Ray Archer and all that kind of stuff. But I brought, like, loads of sponsors to the table, like Animal, Globe, who I was with at the time, Muckoff, who I know really well, all those guys. And then did the GP. But then after the GP, I kind of thought, and it didn't, you know, for whatever reasons, Rob didn't want to continue with it. So it all just kind of stopped. And I thought, well, you know, I was still writing in the magazine at that time. And I thought, well, you know, I brought so much to the table to that team. Why don't I just do my own? Yeah. You know, and, and at the time, that off season as well, it must have been getting nearer around the time where I started doing all the bike tests as well for still doing them for dbr but then so then i sort of fell into doing it with moto 
And it just seemed the perfect time to start my own team. So I started Twisted 7 team, which was just me and Brian McKenzie in the first year. Yeah, I yeah. remember that. So it was a good team straight away because Brian was at the top of his yeah. game then. Yeah, so that came about from doing a bike test in, uh, how do you pronounce it, Grovendonch? Or what's that big track, that big, in, in the Germany? Hall, the Gravenbroich. Yeah, that's it, yeah, sorry. And um, Grovendonch, that's where another it was, track, isn't it? Was it? I don't know, I can't remember. I've been to so many. And... Um, Stevie, Stevie Gutteridge was just there with the test as well. And I remember just being sat on the tyres, um, talking with him. And he's like, so what's your plans? I'm like, well, I'm probably, you know, I'm pretty much done with like pro, you know, like pro level racing now. I just want to do the media thing and ride for a bit of fun. And I'm thinking about starting my own team. And without any hesitation, because I've, you know, obviously got a good, good relationship with those guys. He just went, well, we support that. Literally like that. And then that, like on the flight home, I was like, well, that's it then. I'm going to do it. God, can you imagine the paperwork and all the anger <laughs> yeah, no, that I'd have to go through now? Exactly. So, so Kawasaki got behind it. And then I did that for three or four years. I then quit in 2005, riding, and then got Richard Lawson in to effectively replace me. So actually, Brian was young at that stage. Really it, young. Yeah, yeah, because I was thinking then, and Brian's only retired, well, I don't know, three, four years ago now, mm. all gone, but he raced for so long. So yeah, I remember him. He was on a 252 straight, wasn't he? Yeah, that's what we started on, KX 250s. And the reason... He was already on a Kawasaki and riding for Team Green, so that was a natural progression that Stevie sort of G suggested. But also, there was the K, I think it was called the KWS series back then, wasn't it? Yep. And I went to one of them without my brother one time. Um, that's it. Kawasaki, after, the, after RTT, Stevie G lent me a 125 to race for a bit of fun that year. And that's how it kind of started. And uh, the bike... I, I, I nipped a ring or something like that. And I, you know, I've never been mechanically minded, mainly because the old man back in the day told me straight. And my old man was one of those, if he tells you, you know, you, you do what he says type thing. And he said, never worry about the bike. I'll always take care of it. If I don't, your brother will. So that's basically how it transpired. But he didn't come to that one. And the bike, you know, just nipped up. So I said, like, oh, that's me done for the day. So I thought, oh, I'll just go up to the commentator. I remember Dobby winning that day, actually. Uh, it was at Donington. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. And the old yeah, one out the back. Good. Yeah. It's a good track. And um, so we put a, we put a call out over the you know over the PA to say like can anybody help with a part or whatever. And to his credit, Bry not only come and helped, like as in to say you could like. Well, initially he's going to borrow his bike, but in the end he thought, well, I don't want to do that because he thrash it. So he ended up actually not only he actually repaired my bike, and I'm racing against him in the same race. I mean, how often. You know, so in between races between he motos he came over and stripped my bike down and put a new ring in it no way and then we lined up on the gate in the next race did you beat him I think I might have done that <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, actually quite good competition at the time <laughs> it's di- yeah because obviously just say at, yeah it's better for the story we were at, we were at the, obviously different yeah. ends of the spectrum he was a young rider coming through and had loads of ability and was super fast I was had loads of, loads of experience but was obviously getting slower so but anyway, and I always remembered that. So the minute I said about starting a team, I thought, well, I know who I'm going to go to. We'll definitely yeah. get on board. And so that worked out really well. And obviously, we've been real good friends since. So with BC and all that, it was, yeah. it was good years. We had a good, real good crack. I at remember it. that. And then they were, Bri was always really good to me, same as BC. It was, um, they just, they always worked so well together, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so we did that. And then one winter, you know, of developing the team, we had one year where we went to Honda. Um, mainly because Billy was in Bry's ear because that's when Billy was riding for Cass, was it? Yeah, it could have been Cass on. And he's like, get get Jeff to go and speak to Honda because then I can get you some special parts and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and we did. And we, you know, and the guys at Kawasaki were really cool with it. They're like, yeah, do what, do what you've got to do. If you think that's the way to go, go for it. And we did. And we had a pretty good year with them. And then, and then that hot support kind of stopped and we had one year on. Huskies, when they were still Huskies, not owned by KTM. Oh, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, which didn't, didn't really work out. But then, out of the blue, one winter, I just got a phone call from, from Steve saying, um, g- give Ross Burridge a call, he wants to speak to you. So I called or Ross, or Ross called me, and they literally said, look, we really like what you do, would you stop running your team and come and run Team Green? Which is you where know? I started as well, Team yeah. Green. Yeah, Team Green's still a running thing now, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm still doing it now. Like, yeah. 11 years later, I'm still still managing. I mean, it's now predominantly... It's gone, like, different levels of support yeah. through the years. When I went in 2000, well, I, w- I wouldn't even know the year, maybe 2000, um, Team Green picked me up on a Kawasaki 85. So, um, 
that huge support back then massive yeah. like to be part of team green when i was there was the pinnacle of youth like when you got on team green you would what was it full paid for everything F- no bikes. not like but it was just no, the best thing as a kid yeah a lot of product like call up i used to speak to steve gutridge every monday morning hi steve i won at the weekend yeah yeah <laughs> just every monday i remember calling the reception at kawasaki hello steve there please it's tommy i can only being imagine like, that phone call <laughs> can you being like 10, i was only 10 years old every morning every monday morning i'd call steve and tell him my results um but you don't do that now. He probably no. spoke better back then than he does yeah, now. Yeah, I would have like, done that. Oh, like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and then I would say, um, oh, can I get a new set? We had goat goggles at the time. Actually, That's when I right. signed for them, they had Fox. And then the year I started, we had Kenny. So that was a bit of a wounder. Because actually, Fox, <laughs> I was good. And Fox was like, then sponsored me personally. And I got my first deal. And Steve was like, no, um, we we wear Kenny now. And I'm like, oh. And then anyway, I wrote, wore, wore Kenny, which was no problem. Because um, it was... It was the best thing to be on as a kid. Yeah. Um, but I used to call Steve Gutridge every Monday and he was, I still speak to Steve all the time now. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just funny how I used to call out. I mean, he'd know more what I used to say because I was so young. But And then I'd ask him, he's like, do you need anything? Do you need any tyres? And then I'd say, no, no. And then dad was, dad would be there. Dad, like, why'd you say no? <laughs> yeah. He's <laughs> like, it's like, why'd you say no to the tyres? <laughs> we always need stuff. I'm like, oh, I didn't want to ask for anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet you're not like that now. No, so, I'd always say yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you're right, you know, and, and down the years it's just depending where the industry's at, budget or whatever, yeah. but they still predominantly want to make it uh like a youth only team. And you know, and th- we've had a few really good years. We won a load of championships where there was more support. You know, we had like Lewis Hall, Dylan Woodcock, Jed Etchells, Joel Rizzi, Bobby Bruce, they've all been on the team and all won sort of championships for us, you know. Yeah. So I think it's been 11 years and I think we've won a title. It, 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 last year was the only year we didn't win a title in some description, national title. So yeah. it's gone all right, you know, but it's um, it's not getting any easier. But then that's the sport in general with, you know, budgets and stuff out there at the moment. So Is that the main, like, crux of the thing, budgets? Yeah, I'm sure the guys at Kawasaki would love to do more. I'd love to do more with it. You know, it's, it's, it's changed a bit because... Obviously, back in the day, Kawasaki was so... Pr- when it started in the 70s with Alec Wright, you know, it's this... You know, the, the 100 class back then were literally all Kawasaki's and yeah. most of the yeah. 80 class because <coughs> yeah. they were the only guys really making it. But now, you know, the 85 is still a good little bike. You would have raced it. And it's it still is. The same, and it's it? a rel- it's, it's great bike. It handles amazing or whatever. But obviously, you know, they, they haven't kept developing that at the rate that KTM and Husky no, and, yeah. and those guys have. So sometimes having to sell that is uh you know to riders because they're so short-sighted maybe not the riders but the parents don't look at the long term you know where where you're going to end up and the support with a manufacturer yeah. they just want quick results there and then yeah because then if you followed it all the way through to factory yeah. kawasaki that's a proper uh, good buy. yeah and they don't make a 125 anymore which is which is yeah that, was... that is a real stumbling block for, for team green i know the guys at kawasaki won't you know don't necessarily mind me saying it but but it is you know it we've got a hole there when we if we get a rider on 85 we've got to make them not make them politely ask them if they want to go straight to a 250 because we can't put you know with yeah. Kawasaki you can't put a, no. you can't dress another bike and no. pretend it's a 125 well, so but racing do yeah but I guess because that's not the official you know this is this mm. is Kawasaki UK's team so they can't be yeah. doing that and it, it causes a bit of a problem but you know we've had good riders that make the jump straight to a 250 so you know we've got some good riders this year so Kawasaki don't make a 125 at all anymore no no yeah, because obviously when I come up through, yeah, I done all the one. team green, and then I went through one, two, five. Yeah. I done it all. So what? What Jeff just mentioned there, I was Kawasaki eighty five. I actually was KTM sixty five. It was the opposite then. And then KTM, I was the first rider in the UK to ride a KTM sixty five, and mm. I, there would be thirty nine Kawasaki's on the line, one sixty five, and that was me on it. Yeah. Um, and um, and then there was no eighty five. So KTM said to me, "Are oh, the You've got an eighty five because I won this challenge thing, or you can have a bike of your choice when when you when we make it for you. So in the meantime, I went with Kawasaki eighty five, and then I went eighty five small wheel, big wheel. That's right. One two five raced through onto the progression team, like you says, onto Molson Kawasaki, and then I actually left. But m- almost one of the things I wish I'd have stayed because then Molson went to Tom Church, mm. or it was always um, the churches that own that team, but then they went from one team and I went to factory KTM which is always a dream yeah, but yeah. they also made um, their team got huge that next year so 
it was just one of those things that was m- my time was sort of up. I got the offer from Factory KTM, but the way Kawasaki ran their program, which is still on now, it yeah, worked. It's still, <clears throat> you know, it's got the history, it's got the heritage. You know, it's arguably the most successful youth team in British motocross, and it, that, I didn't hesitate at all when Ross called. You know, because I grew up in an era where Team Green dominated, and just yeah. to be asked, just to be asked, was an honour. So I, I literally, just you said, know, yeah. like Rob. It's thought the idea of the strip ten was a good idea. I literally bit Ross's hand off and went, "Well, yeah," because at that time the, my twisted seventeen was, you know, going good or whatever. But it's hard work. It's, it's yeah. hard, it takes a lot of effort. Not that I'm against effort, but hard work. You know, to find the resources to do it, and then all of a sudden somebody's offering to pay you to do what you were doing anyway, and not have the pressure of going out and finding all the sponsorship. Yeah, I was like, "Yeah, I'll do that." So I'm, as I said, I'm still doing it to this day. So um, I love it. You know, and particularly. Work at you know when, when you get older, um, and then you can start seeing how you used to be, and then working with youngs. It's just it's just liberating, isn't it? They're full, you know because you they make so many mistakes. They're full of back chat, the banter, you know, loads of piss taking. It's it's brilliant, you know. It keeps me on my toes. Yeah, that reminds me of Dylan Woodcock when Absolutely. he was in America. There you go. There you go. You've just experienced it. Chatting the most shit at sixteen years. Oh, no yeah. less. What was he when I seen you out there on an eight? He was fourteen. We were, I 14, think we were getting ready yeah. for to go and do yeah. the Monster Cup. Yeah, the Super Mini. But they're we? all the same. The kids at Macross. We can walk around now. And when well, I well, you were, you would have been the same. Yeah, I was the same. And you've got the little camera out there, all shouting and screaming, That's and exactly everything. All, so, all mouthy, all yeah, they're all nuts. And you get your couple. You obviously, there's all so many different types of kids, but they're funny when you're it at takes, the races. It takes them. a you know a lot to run any team, but when you, I think, when you run a youth team, and if you've if you've lived it and you've been a rider, you know, and seen and then fell, fallen into the industry with the media and everything, and you kind of got a better world view, like. It, it's the, it's the micromanagement we're working with the rider and and the parent that is the most time consuming. Yeah, you know, like sometimes it, it, it's it's educating in the many cases down the year so. the parent more than the kid because you know they're yeah, like, the oh, yeah we're doing this we're gonna get and you're just like mm, it's, you you oh, I because see we do such a job with a good job in promoting the sport in many ways people don't see the backstory and actually it's not all you know like all like roses you know no, it's, the, it's all smoke and mirrors a lot. Are nuts. Yeah, you're just like oh, we got this, and we we're doing this, and you just well, go. Can we get this, or you just shaking? Why your head aren't we going, getting that? What, and you're like, it's strange why? though, isn't it? Because in any other sport, it's motorsport, I would say, not that I'm an expert, but Formula One, MotoGP, all of that. So sort of when you sign for one of the pinnacle teams or something like that, the parents almost get discarded. Yeah, like, oh, but I think it's as bad in anything. I can imagine it is, but it seems the way that's like they're pretty much this is how it's worked. Yeah, but like in motocross, it's just a, the parents, especially ones that haven't been involved but even once they've been involved you, the things they come out with because they want the best for their kid but they don't always know what the best is it's true and on top of that they they do think that the sort of pot at the end of the rainbow is bigger than way bigger than what it actually is so they think well you know why aren't we getting this you should be getting factory engines we're getting this number of bikes what you're like yeah, someone's got on. To pay. there's riders winning british championships at the, the mx1 or mx2 class that aren't getting that yeah but they they're under the illusion that they they are getting way more than that and yeah. they should be getting the same you know and, and obviously you go to america where there's arguably more industry support and then you hear stories of the youth riders over there getting you know on like a monster army program and getting paid money at the, they're like well why aren't we doing that well if we had the money to do that yeah I'm, I'm sure we would you know back when alec wright started it you know if you just think alone the amount of bikes that kawasaki were selling in the in the hundred class alone almost would have easily t- probably tripled quadrupled the budget we're working on now because it's all relevant to the number of yeah. bikes that they're selling yeah. so it's um it's a minefield running a youth team but i do i do love it yeah because if you have one or two if we just get one or two every few years that comes through and actually goes on to do something you're like okay you'd like to think that you've, you've done a little bit of that to, to get them where they are so it's it's rewarding mm. it's really rewarding yeah and then now with the a bit like current times you were obviously involved in the mx nationals as well and the series and what do you see of that through i know you've done some bits and pieces on your own channels yeah. before <clears throat> how it is now for the youth like what can be done or oh, what yeah. do you oh. think because right so we get yeah i see it from my side i see what there's a lot of n- negative things but also with the mx national championship and even the british championship how they're running now i think it's quite good as to such and there's so much media in the in the UK now with people doing videos and marketing. I mean, I think 
whether it comes back around, but what's trying to be done, I think is quite good I, for the kids. Yeah, obviously I've got more involved. I started off doing the commentary with the MX Nationals, but now <coughs> actually more involved, you know, and, and part, of, and the, part of the team, integral part of the team with trying to drive it forward. Um, but I totally agree with what you're saying. Like, you, you know, whether it's the MX Nationals, the Revo British Championship, all, all these other things, now, this is the way I see it, now more than ever, like we should be as an industry just really focusing on making a brilliant domestic scene because, you know, there's so many riders, like we said, to go and chase the GP dream and whatever, and we were talking about it before we came on. It's it's just getting harder and harder to do that. There's no sort of structure. You know, like I said, beginning of the show, you had to earn the right to go there before by through a strong domestic scene. So that's gone all out the window. And, and obviously in front for, and I don't blame them because it's, they want to, elevate the sport but it's also a business yeah so there's way more gps than there ever was before it's getting harder like you said as a gp right it's arguably one of the reasons maybe you you know you stop because of the traveling and, and just everything it's it's bonkers so if we had like everybody working together and that's the key thing that's what makes it so difficult personal agenda politics whatever you want to do but i wish people would for the greater good of the sport i know it's never easy and the world's not like that but if we did and built an absolutely got everybody in the industry working together on dates, so there's no date clashes, and say, right, let's make an unbelievable scene in the UK for these kids and give them a platform to get good enough. And so they don't have to keep chasing, you know, to go and do this European thing. It's getting harder and harder. Make them good enough in the UK, and then we can sort of springboard from that. Because, like you said, the, the, ta the talent's there and the opportunity there, you know, with more media and everything. The MX, you know, now we've got the live stream thing going on not only with the MX Nationals, but also with the Revo. It's, it's like we should be concentrating at home to get TV, like get them across to a wider audience in the, in the UK. And then we might start getting, you know, genuinely outside brands from the sport to go, I like this. You know, this is, this is kind of cool because they're seeing it on live streams yeah. and whatever. Yeah. And go, actually, there's a kid there that I want to sponsor. He's really cool. And you've got more chance then of getting a financial sponsor through being seen in the UK that might go, do you know what? I'm going to bankroll your career and get you to GPs. Yeah, there is. If, if, if you were making a good UK scene, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's pretty tricky, like, in terms of, you, like you said, getting everyone together and getting everyone to do the same thing. Do you think that there's, like, a bit of a, too much of a competition between MX Nationals, Revo, all trying to be better than each other rather than trying to help each other? Yeah, you know, obviously, down the years, for whatever, I wear many caps, so I try to be diplomatic as much as I can. I guess that's why I've ended up in the position that I am. Like, I don't always shoot from the hip. Maybe I should, but it it absolutely... We're getting to a, like, always critical point. Like, just, it has to happen, because we've got so much going on. Just for once, just, just sort of wind egos in, you know. And if you are a real fan of the sport, which everybody says they are, that are running all these... Do you know what? Why don't you just hire a conference room once a year and all get together and just openly discuss the state of the sport in the UK and how you can work together to, to make it better. Yeah. You, you're going to have to have date clashes because there's so many things going on. But compromise on them. Choose a date clash where maybe it doesn't, it would help a rider that's going to go and do the EMX or something. Don't put a date on, you know, all those kind of things. And it, it's just like... It is, it is hard at the same time that is so many GPs. That's yeah. one of the problems. So many GPs, so many Europeans, and then the, the British Championship Series. So I sort of see both sides that. I see if I was racing... It's hard because when I was at GPs, my focus was GPs, but I was at a level where the teams paid me to focus solely on GPs. So there was a, years from 2008 till 2000. Uh, 16 i didn't race the british championship yeah. so there's six years there I, i'd done the odd one um just to get a bit of race practice in before the series um but someone that's in a different position that's racing for a uk team there's not many now we've only have comrade so i think there almost needs to be until there's that if you if you've got a ride that's fighting for a world championship also racing in england it's not going to happen much anymore they're, no. they're not going to be fighting if they're fighting for a world championship the team's going to say, look, focus on the world championship. Yeah, I think we've got to a point where you've got, to, you, at that level, you even make a decision because of just the number of GPs. When I was, you know, there was 12 GPs a year. So you could fit a domestic British championship Easy. around that. Some federations and people have adapted. The Italian championship, for example, they just whack theirs. They, 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 
they do it before. It's still it's still a national championship. You and still get it all crammed in. It's still a championship in the middle of the year as well. Yeah, but they so but then they're not condensing the calendar, no. trying to fit all this travelling around. So just maybe that train of thought is the way forward. You know, maybe we do have less less rounds, and you bookend the GPs with them, and 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 just think more about the, the bigger picture. Uh, Listen, no, it's I like politics. It's, you're never gonna you're yeah, never gonna tricky. please everybody. Yeah. You, you're just not. I think the UK needs to focus on the UK. Uh, exactly. But I'm saying that. From now, where I'm only in the UK, if I was racing the um, okay, so yeah, throw there was that a question point in my then. career when I rode for Dixon, <clears throat> um, when I come back from Factory KTM 2015, rode for Dixon, Kawasaki UK funded a lot of my um, wage, yeah. So they says, yeah, no problem, we'll pay you this, but we want you to race the British Championship and win the British Championship for us. So at that point, it was it was as important for me. Uh, well, I just had to race in England, so. Um, as well as GPs, which wasn't a problem. I done it. I d- was doing good at GPs, and um, we yeah, won. It would have been a problem if it clashed. Yes, what I mean. So at that point in my career, I needed yeah, to you do both had to make a decision. Yes, but I wouldn't. Have, so I wouldn't would, have wanted what, to miss what, a GP at that point either. What because would Tommy Searle sat here right now advise well, young Tommy Searle if he walked through the door right now, saying, "Right, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to concentrate well, on EMX or no?" Because at that year, I would. My heart was still in GPs. Yeah. Um. But at this stage, we've not got really anyone in it. No, but I'm just saying. So, so for example, if if you were mentoring a kid that was showing potential oh, then in the go UK, GP. no, I meant a real like as in 85 CC. Yeah. What, what would you would you say? Look, don't, <coughs> don't just get yourself over to mainland Europe as much as you can. Don't bother with racing the domestic stuff. Um, That's the thing. It's hard. Tri- to, yeah, really tricky. I mean, I think if they're, it's so hard to get that kid that's that focused. I mean, if they're, I wouldn't say go to mainland. And ride in Holland in the sand if they're getting thirtieth place and yeah. mentally getting beat down every weekend. Exactly. I would say get your confidence up, race, win, but also go and do a little bit. I think you need to be around good riders to improve. You know, a good a good thing. I'm not saying this would definitely work. It's just sort of as we sit here throwing ideas out. You know, maybe we go back to some kind of grading system, even for the kids to go and do the EMX through a national championship. It's not very really much like oh, obviously parents or the ones that have got good backing or. You know they can go and get to do it, but maybe we should say, look, you know what, you actually have to in the in the British Championship in the kids classes, you've got to be in the top six in the one, two, five, or eighty-five before you can before you yeah, can even go anywhere. and do, yeah, EMX. So then, <clears throat> so then, like you you you're focusing on that and getting the level up in the UK. Again. I think they do that in a in a similar fashion in the road racing. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but that Red Bull Rookies Cup, I think you have to qualify yeah. in a way to be. Selected to go and, and do not it. only that, if you if you kind of did that, you know, then maybe the ACU would, you know, like uh, they, they help the trip. Yeah, because you're not you got you haven't got random kids who's just got they've been going because they've got more resources, you know, mm. and that's easier because you are no you're sending you're sending your the yeah, best, best of the best, and to be so, there you've already achieved something exactly. So I've got a pretty wild idea, which oh, let's hear it, Ed. I love wild ideas. Uh, I don't know how you'd police it, but I can't um, get it's a not strip a, club it's at Fox Hill. It's too late. No, it's in t- not on Easter. <laughs> it was more like a. I know they already do do a designations and a junior designations, but more of a not a designations as such, but like a um, like a regional. Do they do anything regional? Like no, not really a big regional cup. So like the South sends the best motocross riders, the North sends it, and then. Some form of budgets or well, you get funding. you get like a just sort of club regional team events, but you don't get like a like yeah. a Loretta's. That's yeah. one other idea that's been thrown about. You know, like is are we putting? You know, there's so many championships to go for, and the kids are getting pulled all over the place. They love it. They that's a little bit more that. less this year, though. Yeah, from what I see, at one stage I was like six, and I looked at every kid's Instagram, and they was all British champion. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, "Where well, are you all British champion?" <laughs> there's six of them that have got in their thing British champion. I was like, "Well, when I done it." There was BSMA and it was ACU and the ACU was the main one. Yeah. If you won the ACU, you was British champion. That's why it goes back to saying getting everybody in the room because I, I think we're too far gone now. We, we got, we got so many different federations and different championships, you know, to get it back to one, you, people are just going to have to go by the wayside. So I think we're almost too far gone. So you've got to go, okay, well, what do we do? Because it's spiraling out of control. Like there's, you're almost like you get people now just going to do, they almost choose, Oh, he's doing that one. Yeah, I'll do the other one. So I'm going to do the other one because I might win that. And so it's like, so you haven't got that. It's not developing riders. It's not, you know, you're kind of... Yeah. Then when they go to the European Championship, <coughs> their head falls off. Yeah. 
it just falls off. Like I've seen, I know kids in the UK that are really good riders. You watch them, you see them practice, and you think brilliant rider, and then they go to the European and they struggle because the the levels they're all such good riders. Then it comes down to which riders comfortable and under that in that condition. There's not a lot at the moment British kids that are comfortable in that environment, but. I think that's one of the things that I don't know. Even myself, I, if you work with a kid, yeah, you can do it. But I don't think there's one there's one explanation to get good in that. No. Some kids have either got it or they haven't. That's I one so. thing. I think. But what I'm saying is, we don't seem to be other than on forums. We, you know, the, the powers that be aren't having this conversation. Sat down, the ones that can actually make a difference and change it. But yeah. they're still just saying staying segregated and all just going off doing their own thing. We, right now, we've probably thrown out two or three ideas in ten minutes. You know that, that the people that can make the changes need to all get together. If do you know what? If nothing comes of it, everybody else in the industry would go. Well, okay, at least at least you did it and give it a go. Mm, but yeah. come on, like I do think at the same time it's good. No, with the with the ACU and. Uh, with the British Championship and MX Nationals, two great series. Is I think so. I yeah, think yeah. it's um, it I needs really, two at the minute. It, yeah, it does. You know, it doesn't. I don't think it's, one is strong enough. And for somebody like yourself now that's racing in the UK, to, you know, because that British Championship would then have to clash with GPs on certain dates. So, and if you start well in one or whatever, I think there's definitely room for yeah, two. I two agree. solid there's room for two. Like domestic championship. And with how they do, one's a little bit different. One's yeah. the fastest forty. Exactly. One's British Championship MX one, MX two. Um, I think the best thing that's come out of all of that in the last two years is the live stream, though. Yeah, that is brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, it's been going all right because it gives like I mean, say, MX nationals pushed that, and then the British Championship also jumped on. Yeah, well, actually, I, I remember Gareth did it first with an event down at Little Silver. Um, I think it was a pay per view thing. But what really kind of rocketed that forward is when the MX nationals put their head on the chopping block and ran through COVID, where others didn't. Yeah, and they and they. Basically, to make people see it, everybody was stuck at home. That's when they introduced it. And the first two were pay-per-view, but they went off really well. You know, they, they, they streamed well. There wasn't any hiccups or anything like that. And then, obviously, off the back of that, Neil and Paul went, well, do you know what? We need to get this scene to more people. So rather than do it pay-per-view, let's do it free for view. And, of course, that's what's just put it out there now. It's, yeah, it's like it's numbers are coming in and yeah, everybody's getting to see it. Right, I, you know? I'm not sure if they do that abroad, but that's what I think. I think the UK Championship's brilliant, and I don't. I think you can talk about it round and round in circles, and you're you're not really going to get anywhere because everyone has done for ages. It's mm. only the people that can do it. But I think as far as it goes, it's it's healthy. Yeah, like he says, it's hard for the the end goal at the minute to see who's going to make money and get mm. to the top. But like he says, you need someone really, really well, good. Well, like right now, for example, the A, so the, the MX Nationals has now gone back. To, to ACU it, it was Nora for a little while it went back to the ACU this year because of all the stuff that happened last year where there was date clashes and which didn't help anybody I'm not you know I'm not finger pointing or whatever it, it, I'm just stating the facts it happened we had an MX National the same weekend as a British Championship you're like oh man come yeah, on that was, how has that happened yeah that was outrageous really. so it's now you know so you just love to think regardless of what the Bridgestone do, you know, and Colin does a good job and the service of Darren and all them, they're all, there's a championship and the AMCA, there's loads of stuff, but certainly the MX nationals and, and Revo, you know, if they're, if they're sort of marrying up a bit better and, and getting the dates right that fit around EMX and whatever, then we've got a real good chance of getting young riders back on track to be, what well, I would say, uh, to get to a standard where they can go and do the EMX and get used to it. Cause we've had so many good riders, They've come through and, like I said, go there and just for whatever reason that they're yeah, not. I don't know the reasons. Like well, people say, why aren't they? Why aren't they just coming up through like they once did? Yeah. Is it just a <coughs> a phase, or is there a reason for it's it? It's just or a not? whole lot of structure. The, the how we fit the races in. They don't race the same schedule. You know, you look at the French Federation, the Spanish, the Italian. They all take riders there with genuine support, and I know they might get it, some of it off government backing and all that, which maybe we don't. But still, they go there organized with yeah. a, with a for, with the federation right behind them, is it any wonder that, that France has won as many nations as it has of late? When you know, if you go back towards when I was sort of quitting and riding and packing up, that's when they were starting to build that federation, and that you saw a French presence at GPs way more with like young riders and nurturing them, and then they just they just now it's, it's like a bloody you know conveyor belt, isn't it? It's just year after year, yeah, one after another. Yeah, and the, and the little the young Italians that are coming up now again. Yeah, like um. Well, you've got Ferrato, you've got uh, that 
young one that got a third but at the first them, race. Don't you? What I mean is you see you see them at the races. At the, the, the federation, yeah. they're there, like they're all walking around their Italian. You know, it's, there's yeah, a structure the support coming from the federation. Yeah, so that, that's something that I think we. I mean, literally, you could feel you could feel a podcast every day of the week talking about it. Well, why don't we change the subject then? <laughs> okay, and why don't we talk about your event, Rocket oh, yeah. Till Sundown, which is probably a bit more of a chilled, fun. Uh, it is what? so. Yeah, where do I start with this? So, Steelhawk Motorcycle Club. I come up with a name like I did with Twisted Seven and everything. That all stemmed from the GP back in 2004. Mm -hmm. That's where it started. It's been like 18, 17 years in my head. So we did what we did over there with Julie. Julie Coyne started the, or was integral in running the the motocross club on the Isle of Wight Vectors Club. Yeah. And then obviously we worked together on the on the GP. We was an integral part of that. Sort of sitting under Rob doing what we were doing. And I can remember, actually, um, two days after the GP, we, were, we was at Gore Basin. And we were just talking through how the GP went and whatever. And again, kind of throwaway comment. We sort of just said, you know, one day we should, we should do our own little events. So that, that's actually where it started, two days after the GP in 04. Yep. And then 17 years went by, literally. <laughs> you know, I'm like, when did, when did that happen? <laughs> just never seemed to find the time to think, okay, let's do it now, but... You know, and then all of a sudden in, in 2017 or whenever it was, um, I thought, I think, I'm, I think we're ready to do this. You know, so I sort of rang Julie, who was doing, she went on to do festivals. She does catering at like Glastonbury, Isle of Wight, all those things. So she's got a load of really good experience with event management. You know, when, you, when you're doing stuff for massive festivals like that, the red tape and all stuff you've got to yeah, go through. Yeah, what you need. Because that's the one side of it I, I yeah, straight away we went, have to understand. rule that out. I'm not doing that. Yeah. I listen, I come, I come up with ideas and concepts for events and do the fun shit. <laughs> that's what you don't see with sticks and like running Matley Basin. Yeah. That's the behind the scenes stuff. It's just unbelievable what it has to go through. Yeah. I it's remember so he told stuff. us before when the, in the summer they have to cut the grass to a certain thing so that the grass doesn't hit the bottom of a parked car so the car might set on fire. Yeah. Like, Honestly, he <laughs> only does it with a push along, <laughs> <laughs> like Forrest Gump. Yeah. Um, there is so much more to it running an event that people, you know, just, they haven't got in the, in the nicest possible way. They haven't got a clue. Yeah. And yet, you know, if you have do one little thing wrong, obviously, you know, keyboard warriors and all that, and you just think, God, you know, it's easy. It's just so easy to criticize, and yet the effort just to put on a practice day, these, let alone a, a race meeting or an event. So. Anyway, so, yeah, that's how it came about. And then I thought, right, started thinking of ideas of events we can do. And I just thought, well, an easy one to get us started would be a midweek we, midweek Mercross, you know, because I looked at the calendar again, you know, what we were saying, how it's just yeah, so it's rammed. rammed. But where do we fit into that? So surely it's better to just do a midweek Mercross, get a decent bit of prize money on it, get the pros there and do like a shorter format. And, and we did that down at a little track called Tinkleton down in Dorchester for the first year. And it, it, it was just awesome. You know, Jason Lewis, a good friend of mine, used to race, you know, through his, uh, through his company, put a load of money up. And um, we were off and running, you know, like Elliot won it, I think, the first year. But, you know, and, and, and that was it. And it kind of, in no time at all, it kind of cemented itself because it was short, punchy format. And we try and do diff- things differently. Like last year, we introduced a joker lane. That's not my idea. I, you know, the strip tent is. <laughs> Joe claim wasn't I just looked at the Monster Cup and just thought well why why has nobody ever done that in the UK because it's something different it makes it exciting yeah, it so does we, mate something so like that makes it exciting because if you follow someone all race and then a little joke it's just different isn't it yeah. different it's exciting so so we've established ourselves with that that's kind of been our our blue ribbon event that's got us going and then of course over the years now three or four years started rolling out the other the other ideas so last year we did our first hill climb uh, that was another idea of mine I thought from watching on any Sunday, I thought, why don't we do a hill climb? But why do they stop at the top? Why don't we have it so you get to the top and then you slalom them back down? So you do a straight line up and then you do and it and I thought and then we got there to this this place, Buckland Newton in Dorset, and I laid all the track out. We didn't advertise that a lot because I wasn't sure if it was going to work. And then literally was there. I was thinking, God, I don't know, it's too late now. People starting to roll in the gate. This could, <laughs> is, is this a good idea? Is this gonna end badly or what? After practice, you know, we had people going up there on road bikes. And that's the thing, because we're not, we're not, we're a motorcycle club. We're not necessarily going to do just motocross only yeah, events. Yeah, just whatever. And everybody after the practice run just came down just like, oh, mate, that is so much fun. Oh, see, and I didn't even know about that. Event. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was so good. It's literally just a four, five race up a hill, go down a valley, you G out at the bottom, 
And you go up and then you literally come back down, like hustling bars, coming down and whatever. So we're doing that again this year on June the 11th, I think it is. And of course, we did a good vlog, that. Yeah, you should come and do it. Well, you probably can't, you probably couldn't, but it it is good. Um, Why can't I? Just because Dave wouldn't. Well, I don't know. I'm only thinking dates, what you got on. Uh. So yeah, I'm doing it this year on on that Triumph I've been racing. And I'm going to get it because we're having a moped class this year. So I'm going to do it on a moped. <laughs> Can, so the hill's you not that steep. You want. It is quite steep. Last year we had a moped class and some of them, it was brilliant because they get all the momentum. We, we build a BMX style drop down off, off the, because it's in a valley. So we dug a hill, dug a platform in halfway up one hill. So you drop off and then you get all the momentum down the first hill. Then obviously you hit the valley at the bottom and then you've got the real long drag. So the moped class last year was brilliant. They were all kind of hustling off the gate and then carrying a load of speed and then they just got like a quarter of the way up the hill and it's just like somebody throwing an anchor on them. They were all just like, <laughs> you know, trying to get... I'll have a look. It was so That'd be fun. funny, That's it? a Saturday. I've just looked at the day. It's a Saturday, yeah. Because yeah. again, we didn't want to run on a Sunday because there's people... So a lot of motocross, the uh, right, like a lot of top right, no top riders done that last year. More of a fun event. Yeah, more of a fun event. Trickett came along. He did it. That's a Billy Bolt event yeah. I've ever heard Oh, of. yeah, yeah. He yeah, would love he, that. Oh, he'd love it. He'd, really he'd want to do it on every bike You can going. see it. I mean, obviously, we got we filmed it. It's on our website, steelhawkmc.cc, and on YouTube. So, yeah, go, go and have a look at it. I'll so, we're doing it. that. And then last year, we introduced the Supercross at Cusses, you know, which is, which is weird. For me, that's having been involved with the Arena Cross with Matt, and then obviously, for, for various reasons, Matt's not doing that anymore. Probably, you know, COVID and, and whatnot. But we, we spoke about it actually and sort of said, you know, that's that's like a high-end show because it's bringing people in cities out and mm. you've got to pay for an arena and got to build the circuit and whatever. And I'm like, but surely we should have like a... And me and Matt spoke about it, you know. It's not, it's not like um, we didn't run it by him. And just said, you know, we should have a, a, a UK series that's sustainable, you know, and, and just runs in the summer. Yeah, and again, like France. Yeah, exactly. France have a huge series. Yeah, it doesn't have to be in a stadium. It doesn't have to be an arena. Just outdoors in the summer, we get good. We get good summers. And again, so that's what we're doing. We have done it last year. It went really well. Jack Brunel won it, but he got involved obviously because like did a memorial trophy for his old man. So that so that's, yeah, that now was really step. nice that yeah. he won as well. Yeah. Yeah, like he wanted it though. He won that fair and square. Yeah, no, I see. Because we have good riders in Supercross. Like Big for time. that sort of track, there's a little, there's a Supercross, like a group of riders in the UK that focus mainly on the, that they used to do the arena cross, but good riders. Mm. So if someone like myself go to step in and try and race, hard to beat those guys. Well, yeah. They're, they're well, just good you, at as it. As you well you, know, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, when you come and did the arena cross, you know, those guys are doing, they're doing yeah. it. They're on it. So it, that went really well. Justin sort of revamped the track that he's had there for ages. Um, we got that's, some a, that's a good little, because it just works. I think, you should, can you not do a couple of rounds? Because yeah. remember when um, so Chamberlain we, done that one? Yeah. And I done that. I done it on a, what did I do? We Saturday had to rush afternoon. Up, we had to rush up to Hawkstone, yeah. didn't we? Saturday afternoon, and I drove to Hawkstone before, and then raced Hawkstone. Mm. That was a mega race. So I'm going to... I'll, I'll use this platform to go out on a limb. Basically, we're doing another one this year, which is on uh, Tuesday the 9th, because it's the day before the motocross. So we've put it together like a little mini festival. Ah, so day before see, MX Nationals? No, a day before our Rocket Till Sundown. Oh, event. okay. So you literally do this, this. You can do the Supercross on the Tuesday, and then you do the motocross on the Wednesday, both at Cusses. So oh, you do the Supercross on the Tuesday, good, yeah. and then the motocross is the day after on the motocross track. But... Um, you know, all, all of this is if you don't want to race, you can go and spectate. Oh, absolutely, yeah, hundred yeah. percent, yeah, mm. yeah. All the all the info would be on the, on the website because, like I said, last year we had a good turnout. We ran the kids in the daytime. Didn't you even have a little Strider race? We had a Strider race, which was amazing. Like oh, a red, if, if, they, if they win the the Red Line Motorcycles KTM, yeah, perfect. Yeah, they can they, come and race it. They can well, they can come and have. Was a it Strider or was it? The it was little Revy electric Revies. balance bikes. So we're doing loads of that again. That's really taken off because this year, the start of the year, we did a, a mini bike race down at Wildon called Farm Boy Bash. Was that Steelhawk? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that, so basically building the whole Steelhawk events profile really. So we did Farm Boy Bash at the beginning of the year, in February. Bayliss and Booker came down and raced that. Yeah, I see that. So it was indoor mini bike supercross, and then the little Revy balance bikes. But yeah, so we're doing the Supercross, uh, but for 2023, we're going to turn it into a, a series. You know, we, we kind of put the feelers out after the first one last year, but everything we do, we've worked on the whole pretense that 
we don't over promote it in its first year because it just puts pressure on and we don't actually even know how it's going to work out so we didn't shout a lot about the supercross last year we just kind of like shouted enough of it to get the riders in and do it but didn't really plaster it everywhere yeah. and it went really well so we're going to build on that and then 2023 we're going to turn it into a, a basically a uk supercross series summer series that will run in the summer school holidays so the kids could you know they're all off oh, that's perfect idea and again run it in the week we're not we've got no maybe we'll run the final round on a friday or something so more people can come out but not run it on a weekend because you just you're just going to be fighting for a date in a calendar and we want to we want to have it so people can finish work you know rush down there and or wherever they like are you said summer evenings watch two are or three now. hours yeah watch two or three hours of short sharp racing have a like a beer and a hot dog or a burger easy to follow have a great night and go home that's it you yeah. know and that's 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 for us the the whole calendar is saturated with motocross but the whole ethos of going back to the original question is started Steelhawk because we, I just wanted, I, I, because maybe because of who I am and my GP career and everything, I just want like, you know, it's all too, it's all too serious. Yeah. It's no, all got I completely a bit, agree. It's all got a bit. One off races are good. Yeah. One off events, mate, takes the pressure off the kids. They can go, they can race, you can have fun. Um, cause I, I like the idea of the, the midweek uh, into the, into the, well, when the sun comes down, rocket yeah. till sundown. Cause yeah. yeah, well that was the whole idea. Yeah. Yeah. So I came up with that name for because I my initial thought was having been to the Mini O's and Mammoth, I thought it'd be great to do a little midweek festival. So I tried to come up with a name that yeah. could take us outside of motocross and be, could, could literally become also a little music festival off the side of it. Yeah, yeah. Hence the name. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's where we're going with that. We want to turn eventually like rocket till sundown that whole week will probably be in 2023. It'll probably be like a little midweek festival where we'll have Supercross. Um, you know, the motocross, we'll probably have a mini bike rate, you know, over three or four days and do it like that for 2023. But we're definitely going to, our aim is to turn it into a UK supercross scene, you know, like that's that's what we're really pushing towards. Summer, like a Just summer. Just summer. Because hopefully the arena cross comes back. Exactly. This is not treading on anything. I'd love Matt to come back. Yeah, me too. Cross. I think, I think, I, it's I so, really hope he does. I said on another episode, it's a shame that the UK the young, even the young kids don't support that yeah. championship. Like they're, they're like, oh no, I'm focusing on outdoors. And like, you can do both as a kid. Of course you can at that time me, of year. And 12 years old, just go race supercross, get a skill set, enjoy racing, a bit of pressure. Cause it is quite a lot of pressure mm. in front of the fans. I mean, I raced but it as you, a kid you, all the way what through. What you just said there though, in front of the fans, you know, like we had some arenas where we had like, you know, five, to 7,000 people in there. You, yeah. you know, with all due respect, you're not going to get that at a Revo or a, a MX Nationals anymore. No, you Those don't. days are gone. I and remember. That's why, especially now with a live stream, you know, so the footfall to actually ride in front of that many people with all the lights, the pyrotechnicians. You Doesn't know, of happen. course, I was involved with it, you know, and we've both known Matt long enough. It, you know, there's not many people that could have done what he done. You no, know, Matt's it, good it, at he, events. That's amazing. what he does. You know, having worked big with ball him. stuff as well. Oh my god! You know, again, like big balls laying all that out, like the organisation bringing over the French riders, everything. People don't again; they take it for granted when you're when you're in the inner circle and you're working with him, and you're privy to those conversations. You're like, rather you than me, mate. And and I can sit here now and say we're still hawk. You know, that's not a place where we want to go. Yeah, no. I, I'm telling you <laughs> now, no you won't see us going to say let's go and run in an arena or anything. But what we do want to do is build a, a little sustainable Supercross series in the UK that runs in the summer, that's that's affordable. It, it should be that the kids come, all the top kids come and race it. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't they? I just don't get that. When I was a kid, there was anything I could race, I would race. Do you know now I think that's a little bit when the kids, they don't want to race races where other fast kids are. No. That's what right. we said earlier. They can't like, well, yeah. I'll, I'll just sure. race, 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 race. Every 50 weekends a year. We'd load up in a little van after dad would go and we'd just race. Yeah. And I think that's why now I've always been able to race. Do you know, we never we never hid away from anything. I'd done like when there was a Supercross. Do you remember a Supercross in Ipswich, that stadium? What was that yeah. called? It was we staying at right by we Jake Nichols' yeah, house. So I drove called? past it the other day. Yeah, well, yeah, I went to drive in there not long ago, but the gates were locked. Um, can't remember, but yeah. But this before you started riding, they used to have a Supercross on, it was televised on on what was called back then while well, ITV was TVS Television South 
at Matchams. Yeah, I remember. So I grew up I've seen it on that. YouTube. So that's where that's where my motivation came from. I remember to, racing Matchams Winter Series in that track. Yeah, the Supercross track being there. Yeah, had like an up and over bridge. That was in like the mid eighties, and um, so that was really where my inspiration came from. And talking it through with like Paul. So basically, Paul Alton, who runs Dirt Hub, is also the third partner in Steelhawk. So it's it's Paul, me, and Julie. And that's where the inspiration come from. I just thought back back in the day, but Matcham Supercross midweek. I mean, you used to have people like Ash Kane, who's, you know, Ash is Ash, mm. but he used to drive down midweek from Newcastle to race at Matcham's and go back. It was such a cool scene. And like, well, why are we doing that anymore? So, well, we are now doing it. We're doing one event this year, as I said, and then our totally plans are already afoot to, to turn it into a series for 23. And then we're hopefully up and running, you know, we've, we've bought domain names for it. You know, and all those kind of things to build it. So, are you um, are you looking for any backing for that in terms of always sponsors? looking for backing, mm. Ed? Uh, why do you know any strip bars? Do, well, do you know any strip bars? I don't know any strip bars. I've obviously <laughs> supported you with the you have, lap, and thank you, and for I'll that. continue to do that as as well as we can. But anyone that's listening to this, that's looking to get behind a bit of grassroots motocross, I think get in touch right, with. I'll, Jeff. I'll tell you right now. You know, this you've got the motocross, and you've got two, four, whatever it is. UK motocross championships. We we want to build a UK super. You know the the word supercross. It's not re- Matt rebranded at arena cross because it was in arenas. Yeah, this is okay. It's not AMA standard. We're not in massive football. No, but we we have got an opportunity, and I and I do mean it like that to to just do something different that's easy to get into, sustainable. Going to get potentially a new audience out. You know that punchier, shorter races. You know, and. And we're really serious about it. We're, that's that's our one thing that we're really like. Okay, our other events like the hill climb and the and yeah, the fun. mini bike racing is yeah. you know a proper laugh. We want the same vibe at a supercross, but we actually want to build it into a proper thing. Yeah, where you've got a legitimate you know super you think supercross the, champ. I think the um, the sport to take something from obviously it's quite different is speedway. Um, if you're just watching it. You can turn it on and it's quick, bang, bang, bang. As soon as there's a race, done, next one's on. And it's like, you don't really get bored of it, do you? That was it a was little bit your concept, wasn't it? That yeah, first yeah. short, yeah. sharp. Quick, sharp. Listen, I, I've, I've, you know, I've, as we've spoken, I've raced a, a high level. Motocross is has given me so much. You know, literally, I'm, if, I, if it didn't give me as much as it did, I still, and I'm not on about financially, if it didn't give me, well, I wouldn't be around, would I? I mean, no. I'm still involved in the sport yeah, yeah. because 80% of my friends are in it. I, I've, you know, I, I go away on a weekend. I feel this is just like a genuine reason for being. So I'm a motocross purist and I want motocross in the UK to be amazing. And I, I'm not saying we're trying to like replace it or detract from, I'm trying to say that if we obviously did a decent UK supercross series, that might encourage a few people to go, well, this is cool. How do you get into it? And this is how it works in, in America with Ada. You can't, your entry level is not supercross. You've got to start in motocross to learn the basic skills. Mm-hmm. So if we have one or two people come out and watch a supercross and think this is cool with all the like with the Revy bikes as well. I mean, they were, they were awesome last year. That was the, really, that was probably the highlight of the, of the evening with them going around and all the parents running around. So we're using it as a platform to try and get people into, into the sport of motocross. Cause that's what supercross does. It, yeah. it takes all the best bits and makes it, packageable you know like short and sharp yeah definitely oh, you, and that family aspect of like you say you're going to run an event where it's midweek in the evening family yeah kids running around it's like it's mega in it? it's good for the sport in in many ways the more than just riding bikes yeah weekends are great but you know if, if you're into it once you get into it but for most families that aren't into it you know they, 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 they get either doing diy or they yeah. parents you know the kids get dragged off to a bloody shopping mall or whatever it is this is just like, okay, we're in the summer school holidays. What are we going to do? You know, like just go up there for a few hours, see bikes flying around above your head, loads and all in front of you. You don't have to walk. It's all those little things that we want to yeah. build on. So but we're doing it and we've got other ideas to roll out in 23, which um, I'll announce in good time. But Oh, we're going to have to get you back on. Well, we have got another, we have got another couple of ideas for next year. Yeah. So oh, we'll, get, we'll have but you back. No super, we're focusing on the supercross and the hill climb and, and the motocross for this year. So I'm keeping myself busy, fellas. I've got, as I said, many, I wear many caps, but nobody put a gun to my head to do that. I do it because, yeah, it's just because I'm involved with it. Isn't it? Yeah. You, as simple as that. Yeah, it's nice. It's a bit like. I give it, I, I genuinely give a shit. 
Yeah, you know, I, I literally. Yeah, I'd say you're yeah, the one of the ones that do. I, I you know, I can't. Yeah, you're not doing it. For, you're doing it for all I'm the right I'm reasons. I'm definitely not doing it for the money. I was. I wouldn't be driving around in a Ford Fusion, would I? <laughs> Which it's is a bit great like, car, a bit by like the way. Steve Dixon. I like the, what he does with stuff. Yeah. I, I like how he's he's just the, the I, success I, I, he's had at the last few GPs. I was watching it at the weekend and seeing Harab and, uh, uh, like on the podium last three weeks and about to win that race. And I just thought, no one deserves it yeah. more than Steve Dixon. He's I was like, please in. pass, please pass for the win on the last lap. And I was sat on the sofa. And then when he missed the last lap opportunity up the inside after pit lane, I was like, just swore like fuck no he's not going to win the race because he missed it but when someone does it for the right reasons and it all pays off you just think brilliant I, for me just to sign off it's i know what it is i i made a conscious decision when i was 14 when i got my head around the whole fact that you know i lost my mentor my dad um at that age you know you just turn into a young man all those kind of things and i i can i can remember it you know i distinctly kind of like right okay so where do i go from here what kind of person do i become and I, I actually did at that age make a conscious decision that whatever I was going to do, it wasn't going to be motivated by like money or or status or to try and impress. It's, it's actually like do what you, you know, make a difference, try and do something that you really love. And at that point, I was obviously two or three years into starting motocross and that's it was my absolute like life. I lived, lived for the weekend. So I thought, oh, surely I've just got to pursue that. Just Just do... If you're into it, yeah, you give a shit you like. enough. Yeah, like otherwise you're not what you're doing. You know, you just you've got to have something. And and it, I just what can I say? I just love going to the races. I love the people. It's yeah, like you said this it? weekend, you come into Marshfield on Friday. Yeah, you're coming to Fox here on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I just, it's your life. It's, 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 yeah, it is. It is a complete a complete way of life, and I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, and you the, must really like Mondays at six pm then when he drops a new video. Love it, <laughs> <laughs> love it. We've been trying it. That's another thing that's. <laughs> Bring in a little bit. There's so nice I get, plug. Nice plug. <laughs> yeah. Too busy. Monday on a six pm. I'm probably writing a race report or doing something. <laughs> you know no, I but that the videos have brought so many. The amount of messages I get from that as well from the people saying, oh, "I I used to race and I didn't race and now I've seen this and it motivates me." So, like yours says, your your evening races gets people that used to do it back into it. Yeah. Gets new people into it, and it's exactly what we need. Yeah, it is. I'm listen. Like I said, I'm not. We're not trying to add more confusion to weekend dates or whatever, or saturate it. Just we just want to make cool little events, one-off events that are a bit quirky, something different. You know, to take away from all those strains and stresses of going and racing a championship, and just have just a laugh. Have, just have a laugh with it. Really, basically, that's it. But try and do it in a professional. Can, you know, can we go to some this year? Do you want to do some? Yeah, I would like to do some. Well, here's one. I'm, I'm not sure if I should say it, but I'm going to do it anyway. All right, we can always cut it. Great. <laughs> um, so, Jake, I've got a text message on my phone. Is, is text... Uh, Nichols. Yeah, is that a binding contract, with a, a WhatsApp message? A text like a handshake, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's as good as done, it. it's like sealed. It's Actually, it's, it's better because it's there, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Like, you've got a, you've you got a paper trade, that, as yeah. it were. So, uh, he's racing the Supercross. Yeah, Jake... There you go, because he's built a Supercross track. Jake loves to race, like, he's... He's just a racer. Like he doesn't care. Like you said before, now he do, he doesn't do it for money. He's got a bit of money. He just loves to race. So it I doesn't surprise me in the slightest that he like he wants to come race your Supercross. I will say this though: not only is he coming to do it, he he has supported him <clears> for the last well last year in particular. So basically, he's jumped on board with what all the concepts that we're doing, and he is a sponsor of Steelhawk, obviously through his company. Well, whichever company is True Seven. Yeah, whichever one it is, is that the all like, of them? True, I don't plant, know true seven, exactly. True, the true seven, true group, true group, true group. So Jake has has got behind what we're doing. He he likes the idea. He'd so like, fair play to him, yeah. you know, because honestly, didn't go to Jake with a begging bowl. You know, I just casually mentioned it to him, and, and no, he, he got, likes and he, that. and he got involved. So. Jake's another grassrooter though. Like, yeah, he, he is. just fucking loves. It really is. It's nice to see now. Even more so, people sometimes have the wrong perception and then even this year I've spent so much more time around him see what he puts back in and he's there to support anything yeah. and he's just a racer so he'll be up against it though because he'll have to race Woodcock Brunel no They're but he it. don't it's, he's not going just to he won't even Clayton. he's not going oh I'll go there win he just he just loves it Talking of... I'm not sure if Walshie's going to come and do it obviously I'm not sure where him and Woodcock are at after their little oh, their beef. thing Woodcock's going to get him Oh, maybe I should invite them both <laughs> for our event. No, maybe. that's what you need to do. Invite them both. <laughs> oh, God. That'd be the highlight. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, just say, you know, pull the crowd in. No. Um, talking of binding text messages, Billy's just texted me and says, are you still on the podcast? I'll call in. So should we give him a quick five-minute call? 
call him because yeah he we nearly got him to do it last year as you well know but he right. had to go off and do something he had to he had to go and do another event in Europe in the end because right. he was get... he was on about doing the Supercross last year I'll get him on the yeah, phone yeah he's another one that just loves it yeah <coughs> get him on let's just negotiate right hello now. hello Mr Bolt how are you Hi, thanks how You're, are you boys we, we've Good. got Jeff and Tommy here we're just discussing what races we can enter you for this year we've got a hill climb is that a the bit of you? Uh, yeah, yeah that's just sound a bit of me. Right, Billy, it's a slightly different one. It's called Helter Skelter Hill Climb. We did it last year. You race up, but then you zigzag back down over like a course on the way back down. It's I exactly- feel like we're on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and I wouldn't call this moron to answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> Quick, you've got one minute to answer. So there's that Where one. Do you want to know? Are Let's you in or not? Want. Hill climb or like super, hill climb or supercross. Well, the both sound like they're up my alley. To be fair, yeah, no, that's what. Well, I thought. we very nearly got you doing the supercross last year, if you remember. But you had to, you obviously had to go off and win a more important championship somewhere mm. in the end, didn't you? So maybe we can get you down for the for the supercross in August. If Billy's mid-week. racing supercross, I'll yeah. be there with a camera. <laughs> Do you know what? We got a decent. Uh, Justin built a decent set of whoops. So even if you don't win. If you could just manual through them every lap. Yeah, you could do that. That would be awesome. Yeah, I think I could manage that. That's that's definitely more achievable than the, the, the winning part, I would imagine. <laughs> Whereabouts in the world are you, Bill? What's happening? What's been going on? Uh, in South Africa. Oh. Just about a tuck into a chicken prego. Um, it's flooding quite badly down here. Mad rain. No way. Um, it is mad rain, isn't it? it? Proper mad. Yeah. Uh, so now, what? Anyway, what's the date of this hill climb? Oh, look! Oh, how, look look how keen he is. Right, the hill climb is Saturday, the eleventh of June in Dorset. It's awesome. I'll Any send prize money. I'll send you a link. Well, we might have to negotiate. I'm not sure if we do that on on air. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we. I'll, I'll send you a link. We'll talk about. It. So that's yeah, Saturday, the eleventh of June. The Supercross is Tuesday the 9th of August at Cusses on that Supercross track in the middle there, which, like I said... All right, well, well, put a pencil down for them both, but I can't make any promises. Well, no, but I'm, I'm not always expecting you for, to. For, uh, for something different. This yeah. is good, the call-in concept, clear. Um, um, yeah, well, I was about to say, I'm amazed how clear it is on my phone as well. Like, even if a few of you speak at once or whatever... I'm, I'm very impressed. Well, you're coming through the headphones as well, so we can hear you. It's even more clear if I actually buy the cable that plugs it in, but now we know it works, and uh, we'll have to do this a bit more often. What you will have to do, though, yeah, Billy, well, what you will have to do, though, is still keep putting in your fuel receipts, even though you're not technically driving in to do the show. Still make sure you yeah, invoice Ed for the yeah. fuel. We put, DM. we put Billy in charge of finding a sponsor, and look how that's gone for us. Oh, yeah. I had one, and then Tommy messed that up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got one for this episode we've got Redline Motorcycle sponsoring us today Bill uh, we've got an episode sponsor oh, oh that's good I'm pleased you told us about that before you try to slide that out, out of my eyes no they've, uh, they've is su- there any money in that or just a bite no they've done me a deal on a beta they're selling that beta they give me this bite no, to give know, away it's all, win- it's all ed- 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 this, vlo- this episode listen boys I carry you two <laughs> Billy you must be getting ed's to a- had a busy week to be fair you must be getting to a point, obviously your popularity and everything, where you have got to start maybe having some offers coming in to bin these two off, haven't you? <laughs> or some some uh, higher grade friends. Well, yeah, you know, like because that's how social standings work, isn't it? You know, you just you that's, just that's what up. happened, Jeff. The minute you put you that know, red ball hat, I, on. I know he's I know he's obviously you know like a British champion champion and whatever but you know let's not kid kid ourselves you know his career's on the way down you're on the up you've got you've got to break the shackles of these two I didn't know I was actually surprised he picked up after when he's got a Red Bull hat on now (laughs) it's coming I know (laughs) how was your race in Israel have you have you recovered I think Israel needs to be an episode in itself to be honest I don't want to I don't want to go into too much detail oh is there a lot Um, to talk about but it was eventful. There was all sorts went on in Israel. Um, but it was, in the end, a lot of dramas went on. But in the end, the final day, the actual main day of racing actually was, was good. And the track was good. And the race was actually good. Um, so, well, not, yeah, like I say, not going to too much detail. The final race was actually quite good. I uh, was quite happy with how I did. 
I came second, if you didn't know that. Yeah. Um, well, we'll save it for a full episode so, then. Yeah, you know, we'll save it for a full episode. Um, so now I'm in South Africa at the minute. I planned to come here anyway, but now I've got an injured wrist, which has been injured for a while. I've just kind of ignored it until last week. But now I've decided it is actually injured, so I'm going to rest up here for a couple of weeks and hopefully that. Um, I've been to see some surgeons and stuff, and, and with rest, it should repair by itself, all being well. Um, so thankfully, there's a bit of a break in the calendar too. We've got like six weeks until the next race, so I'm going to hibernate down here for a couple of weeks and try and uh, let my wrist repair without the need of surgery, and, and hopefully all being well, that should be a few weeks' time, and then back to, to get right, ready Bill. for the That's... next round. So the, yeah, you had enough now. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just a I'm quick just call, mate. To thinking this is, awful. Is, he, <laughs> is, he, is he still talking? Yeah, he's I've still just on been the out for a piss bill and come back and you're still talking. Uh, I've that, just, I've just had a thought. Me. Just had a very good thought, actually. This hill climb, we could, we could get the 610 ready. I just thought that as soon as he said it. Yeah. What's happening with the 610, Ed? Ed's in charge of the 610. Well, the 610, I need to drop off to the person that's doing it up, but I didn't know whether you wanted to wait till you were back so that we could film it so you could make an episode out of it. Just get it, just get it gone. Right, I've got to say, it's it is a horsepower hill. You get a bit of momentum going down um, the first hill, but but you got to get you G the, out at the bottom, right? Last year we had a guy on a road bike, his foot peg, he went, he G'd out so much that his foot peg snapped off, and he and he ate shit like really <laughs> hard. Um, but yeah, the, obviously once the you w- comes with its own value, though. To be honest, the the Start money might have to increase for the six ten having an out in that. No, that I knew the start wild. money was yeah. going to be coming to it. Look, Bill, yeah. we've just spent an hour and twenty minutes but talking about how we're trying to improve the, the sport. The yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. I'll have to. I'll have to get my thinking cap on. You know. So what? You know. What kind of figures are we talking about? What? Stick like it, five or what? What? Stick, what? It the, stick it to the committee and see what you can come up with. A pre burger, hot yeah. dog. Yeah, that, be happy. Food, food often helps. Oh no, we do we do good food at our events. We definitely yeah. do good. Yeah, we do good healthy food. Yeah, where well, we've got a cat. You know, Julie's. Yeah, Julie's involved in catering. She's got all the right contacts. We do good, strip good clubs healthy there. Food. There's a strip tent there, Bill. If you're over. Do what? It's a strip tent at the Steel Hawk races. Oh fuck well. <laughs> right, come on, that, we that, got... could be, that could be the clincher right there. Yeah, well, I, I think, think we've got I think it. He's, he's shown his hand there, and he basically <laughs> um, <laughs> got him hooked in with that, haven't we? Right, yeah. we'll see you in a bit then, oh, Bill. Well. we'll leave you to get back to yeah, your chicken well, sandwich. Well, my chicken sandwich has gone a bit cold now. I've only been able to eat chips while I've been on the phone. I didn't want to start chumping because everyone starts whinging when that happens. <laughs> Bulger human well, being. you've been eating chips. I was going to come on. I was going to come on to tell everyone to go and buy my T-shirt that went out last night, but they've smashed it. They don't. No Sold one needs to remind them to do that. Yeah, that's gone. If you've, uh, if you've missed out, I do apologise, but you should have been faster. Need a new um, one, don't you? Need a rerun. He's done a Version 2022 two. World Champion nah, T-shirt. We're, ex- we're exclusive. One run. If you've missed it, you've missed it. You need to learn your lesson for next time. <laughs> Right. But anyway, um, oh well, well. I saw a load of them. Week, I saw a load of them in the bin when I was coming in, in Ed's wheelie bin. <laughs> and we bought that's them up to make him feel good. He sells them on the black market. He's like a paper <laughs> route. Is he? You told him. You told yeah. him to go and sell them, and like a kid on a paper round that don't want to do it, he just he just <laughs> chucked them all in the bin. Said so I sold them all. <laughs> oh well. Right, yeah. Bill. Very nice to speak to you. We'll oh, save well. you to an episode. Nice, nice one. All right. Have fun. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Well, <laughs> William Bolt. William Bolt, indeed. Well, we could, that's that's pretty much as good as a signed contract there as well yeah. as Billy, Billy Bolt would be there. Yeah. Just but you next. What are you going to race up the hill? Um, don't know. I've got a few. I could get something to race up the hill. Honda do quite a few bikes that I could race I up the hill. I know what you could race up the Why hill. Why don't you do the mini bike class? You could, ride, you could race the Dave Thorpe 500 up the hill. I could race so many bikes. <laughs> going up's all right. It's Coming, coming down. down, it's harder. Oh, no, no, it's not harder, no but you, you just what you got to remember is you, obviously you're a seasoned motocross racer, so you got your lines, you got your technique, and all that. We're talking about racing with people that not necessarily know how to stop, uh, and and the skill set a little bit is a little bit, you know, and it's grass and it's off camber and all that. You know, like when Trickett came and did it, he Sounds was like, brilliant. "It's brilliant." Yeah, he's like, "God, how did you, you know?" Trickett was like saying to me because we had a couple of test runs when we set the track out. He's like, oh, man, like, how do you, how do you turn? I said, what do you mean, how do you turn? Because how do you get round there? I'm like, well, 
I guess because what you know motocross tracks back in the day when I grew up in the southwest that's what it was all like Lou was in hell of a mess he, he, he literally would go straight to the tapes and then kind of stop and and do that <laughs> I was just I was just riding by him it was good he, right. he loved it so yeah um, there we go we're, we're right well on. we'll let Tommy go because Tommy's you, you've got you're a busy afternoon again haven't you yeah I've got a few riders to coach more, more coaching and we'll let Jeff get on with his way as we mentioned, there's the, the kids' uh, strider bike from Redline Motorcycles. To win that, all you need to do is go and like their latest post on Instagram and comment on it. And in a week's time, they will use a random comment selector and announce it on their own thing. You're not going to win this one. You are going to win the front board off this because Tommy's going to sign it now. But you're going to win a brand new one in a box, all packaged up, posted out directly to you from them. Uh, Nathan will sort that, so you will definitely get that. Uh, Jeff, thanks again. Thank thanks, you, mate. Good thanks. episode. I do you want to do you want to um, tell us where they can find all the details again? Do you know what? Just drive you straight to Steelhawk. It's just SteelhawkMC.cc. You can know because it's yep. not CC in it. Yeah, mm-hmm. bike related. And then that is that. You, you'll just see everything that we're doing on there. Um, all the events are on there. All the details about it. We obviously got Facebook and Instagram. Um, yeah, with all that going on. And then obviously I'm still doing what I'm doing with Dirt Hub, MX Nationals, Team Green. Busy. Got my steel hawk hat on today. You've got them all on today. So yeah. yeah, Jeff will be at every MX National. Well, I will. Yeah, I shall be doing continuing to do the live stream yeah. uh, coverage with Callum. I think Callum. There's one round that Callum can't make it. Um, so yeah, we've got another five rounds of that. Wicked. Um, they're all going out live streaming on a Sunday, of course. So on MXN TV. Um, yeah, just busy. I'll be at Bob's event and all that. Try to get as many events yeah. as you can. See, see you there then. Yeah. Um, and uh, as for Tommy, don't know when this is coming out. Probably in Monday. By this point, you'll have done Marshfield, Fox Hills, and your French race. Um, and there'll be some videos. So go and watch those on his channel. Busy weekend. It's a busy weekend. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'm with him on Friday. Oh, well, we'll see you there. You might even make the vlog as well. Might. Yeah, we're getting back on. Yeah. We can might, might, this. It's, it's actually, the he's not too far off of calling him back in in the van for a chat, actually. Oh, there we See go. See how his year goes. Radio, thanks very much. We'll See catch you, you all later. Lovely. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.